the director at her first big audition remembers this little girl comes in. She's radiant, her hair cropped very short, barefoot, with these eyes and that smile. And I remember thinking, please, please, let her sing well. And then she opened her mouth, and I was blown away. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic of Newsday. And our guest is LaChance, who blew audiences away then as the star of Once on this Island. And at the 2006 Tony Awards, she blew the competition away with her wonderful portrayal of Miss Seeley in The Color Purple. Awards are talk, award talk is so tacky. <laughs> but, but, um, that was the, the best actress in a musical uh, category was, I think, the toughest one to have called. It was Patti LuPone and, and Sutton Rivera, Foster and Cheetah Rivera. Boston. So, um, so special congratulations. Um, Thank you. Now, you have left the show now after, how long were you in the show? Counting, counting Atlanta? Oh, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Was my stint with the company. From beginning, to, from first workshop, well, almost three actually, almost three years, because uh, we started in January of '04 with the first reading of it, and then we did quite a few workshops, and then the out of town tryout, and then another workshop, and then the rehearsals, and the year on Broadway, and so it's been about two and almost three, just shy of three years for me. Now we're talking in December of 2006, and the news this week is that The Color Purple just recouped its entire 11 million dollar investment. Yes. Uh, you know, you don't know. I want to say congratulations to you. It's not your show, you know. <laughs> well, it's, I'm but, still, I'm still in the family of The Color still, Purple. But um, mm still, when you look at how many shows run. A very long time mm -hmm. and never recoup, uh, which I don't ever understand. But um, do you have some thoughts about the success of Color Purple? Well, I feel that being, well, first of all, I've done theater in New York for several years. So <laughs> looking out at those audiences, I'm used to the theater audience, which is hugely uh, a, 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 a local audience, a, a tri state area audience which is uh, primarily made up of theater goers who visit lots of shows. This particular show has brought in an audience that isn't, that, that we don't see usually in theater on Broadway. It's a hugely diverse audience. We have people coming in from, by the bus loads from as far as Alabama. I mean, people are coming to see this show in droves. And there are a lot of African Americans coming to see this show. And that's making up a huge part of the audience. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's keeping the sh it's doing great for the show. It has actually changed Broadway history in, in that way, mm -hmm. is that according to the League of Professional Guys, mm -hmm. um, there's four per ordinarily 4% four of the Broadway audience yes, is African American. I've read that. Mm -hmm. And even in shows like Dream Girls or um, Bring Into Noise, Bring In the Funk, at mm -hmm. the most, the audience was sometimes 25%. Right. And yours goes, they've said, you know, 50 to sometimes 80%. I'd say 50% is about the minimum amount of people just in looking out. And it's, it's just under 2,000 seats. So, um, so it's a big theater. It's a huge theater. And I look out there, I would look out there at night and see primarily, you know, African American faces. And, you know, and, 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 and it's, it's surprising to see that being in theater. Now, when we were in Atlanta, absolutely, pre predominantly African American audiences. But here in New York, you know, the ticket price is not, it's not an inexpensive ticket price. It's, it's, you know, it, it's not something that's going to run forever. We hope it does. Yeah. But, you know, um, theater has a limited lifetime. So um, to look out there and see so many African-American faces, it was actually a very nice change. Now, how much do you think of that is Oprah Winfrey, who is one of the producers and the most sort of conspicuous name attached to it? And how much is other kinds of really smart marketing, do you think? Well, the color purple for most African Americans who have lived since 19, what, what year did it come out? It came out in the 80s, I, I think. I think 82 was So anyone book, that yeah. was born, you know, from 1970 on, or 60 on for that matter, or 50 on for that matter, has 
some connection with The Color Purple, the yeah. film, and the novel. Yes. And um, I know before Alice even Walker's Alice novel. Walker's novel, yeah. which she's brilliant, but uh, even for myself as a college student, uh, seeing The Color Purple, it became my number one favorite film of all time. And I've seen a lot of film. But as an African-American woman, it just spoke to me directly, um, being from the South myself and um, having my own sense of insecurities as a woman, like so many women do, and all the pressures of uh, my community and, uh, you know, you know the, the stress that people deal with just being a type of individual. I just identified with these women on different levels, all the women in the and show. And it's really female-driven, too, oh, yes, the story. Oh, yes, definitely female-driven yeah. story. Um, although Mr., the male character, and Harpo, the other male character, are very strong elements, it's about the change that these women go through, and pr primarily Celie, and how all the women in her... Over like 40 years? Over 40 years. I started, yeah. started the show at a 14-year-old and then went to 60. Now, so. how hard was it to tell yourself you were ugly? I mean, that was my, my problem, was I'm sitting there and everyone keeps walking around looking at you and going, ugly. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, yeah. uh, the hair designer, Chuck, and the costumer, uh, Paul Taswell, they did an amazing job with transforming me. I remember the first time I put my wig on and that one braid. the plaits. You had that one braid. The right one braid right. right in the face, yeah. which I requested because I wanted that. But he, um, I looked in the mirror the first time and I thought, Wow, I cried. I couldn't believe how much it transformed me. You My cried, you said, look. oh God, I'm ugly. <laughs> I said, oh God, I'm silly. Yeah. I really looked. Um, and you know, Alice, Alice has mentioned to me that silly, unfortunately the, the line of you show is ugly has gotten such notoriety. People have paid so much attention to that, that line that um, she really was trying to communicate how silly feels about herself internally she feels ugly but she really isn't it's how she feels about herself you know so um i went with that so you were born <laughs> in the south you were born in, in florida yes st augustine florida but didn't grow up there lived there for uh, a lot of my childhood and then we moved to connecticut so i had the best of the south <laughs> best of the north mm -hmm. and you knew right off you had to perform Yes, you were, I one, did. you were one of those little girls, right? Well, my mother knew, saw very early that I, um, I liked to perform. I um, spent a lot of time fantasizing about dancing, singing, and acting. I remember as a child uh, in my living room, in my family's living room, I would um, play whatever record, because that's right, we had records when I was a little girl. <laughs> I would play yes, whatever. children. <laughs> I would play uh, whatever record I could get my hands on, and I would go from singing to dancing to dr being very dramatic within one song. And I had a hard time deciding what it was that I wanted to do because I loved doing all three. And when I discovered musical theater, I was, I could not have been happier as a child, and I begged my mother to take me to shows. And, she, was, she started bringing me into New York because we were right up in Connecticut. We'd take that Metro North down. And the first show that I saw was Chicago. <laughs> Not bad. Love Chicago. Not a bad start. And then from there, I just would come in and see shows, and I knew that this is where I wanted to be. And then you went off to Philadelphia, and we're going to do a little bio thing. Okay. Then, you, then you went to Philadelphia when you were in the college, Performing Arts College? Yes, it's but, now the University of Performing Arts. Okay, the University of the Arts of the in Philadelphia. Arts. Yeah. But then mm -hmm. you left so you could come to New York and and be in uptown. uptown it's hot. Well, uptown, I actually, dot, 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 it's, it's hot. hot. <laughs> exactly. I was actually still in school Okay. when that show, I was, it was a summer job at the Tropicana Hotel. <laughs> I was on a summer, it was a summer job dancing in the casino with this show called Uptown It's Hot with um, really, you know, that ensemble had a lot of actors that are off doing great things right now. Elise Neal, who does a lot of um, film and television, she was my college roommate. So um, there are a lot of people that came out of that school, but um, it was just a summer job. I was going back to school in the fall, but the show went to Broadway. And I thought, hmm, leave Broadway, go back to college, yes, or right. college, Broadway. go yes. to Broadway uh -huh. and get my equity card and start working in theater. And it was a very difficult decision, but I begged my mom to let me take some time off of school to do this show. 
and my parents let me come in and let me do it. And um, from there, I just didn't stop. And it was just a few years later that you auditioned for that wonderful quote at the beginning about you with your bare feet mm -hmm. is, was by, is by uh, Graziella Danielle, who was yes. the director of, of Once on this Island. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was just such a picture, such a snapshot of you then. <laughs> it really um, is, is exactly what I looked like. But there you, you had a, um, you got a, a Tony nomination for mm -hmm. that. And that's a musical that, um, that has a, a, an ongoing life. Yes, it does. I still sign autographs. I still autograph playbills uh, from the from once on this island to this day. And T Moon's all grown up now, and I still <laughs> sign autographs as T Moon. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, I I mean I have friends who they do little white kids do it in co in school. Oh, so. it it has such a following yeah. all over the you country. You were Caribbean. You played a. a, a Caribbean, very poor girl. I played girl. a dark-skinned yeah. girl from the Caribbean yeah. who's, who came from a, a poor family. We were considered the peasants, who fell in love with someone from the other side of the island, the fairer-skinned blacks, who considered themselves the bozoms. They were better than. So it really was a comment on race in the African-American community and uh, in the African diaspora and how the color issue plays out, the dark skin versus the lighter skin, and all the complexities and conflicts that exist in the community. And, um, but yet it was also based on um, Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. It was also sort of taken from that and, and set in the Caribbean. You know, a girl from the sea can't fall in love, with, can't be with a man from the land. Just people, two people from two different worlds coming together and falling in love. Before we go any further, would you explain the name? My name? Yes. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Okay. A lot. Rhonda Sapp was my well, Rhonda Lachance Ra Sapp. Okay, so Lachance was in the middle. Okay, yes. great. All right. Rhonda Lachance. Yeah, Sapp I think Sapp was, was my... a good thing to get rid of. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't tell my dad that. I'm sorry. He's in Alaska, right? <laughs> yes. He okay. Is. Don't right. tell my dad that. Right. Or my cousins. Yeah. For that we don't matter. run in Alaska. I don't think so. We're okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, Rhonda Lachance Sapp was the name on my birth certificate, but uh, as I grew up, I just loved my middle name more than anything, and it's my grandmother's name, and so I started having my friends call me Lachance, and when I actually left home, I just said my name wasn't Rhonda at all. It was just Lachance, and then I changed it legally, and when I came to New York to perform, I kept the R for a while. I was R period LaShawn Sapp I, in, in a tour that I did, Dreamgirls actually. I kept the R LaShawn Sapp. And then I didn't like it. I just thought it was too, uh, too confusing. And I thought, you know, I'm going to strike out with one name and see what happens. And, and it, it's, it's Creole it's for one who is one. charmed. Yeah. Yes. It was just lovely. I, uh, I like that. But, like, what do you do on. On um, passports and things, when they ask first last name, I give my legal name, okay. which is now completely different because okay. I've married. Yes, and I use also known as, so I don't have a problem with that uh -huh. anymore, which I'm very fortunate to say. <laughs> We're going to do the marriage thing a little bit, okay? okay. All right. <laughs> um, I think everyone in Broadway, area, you know, knows about what happened to you in 2001 at. Um, at, at the World Trade Center. Yes. Uh, you want to quickly talk about that just to, so that we can move on from that. Oh, yeah. sure. Um, I was married previously, and my husband uh, is unfortunately, he passed. He was uh, one of the victims of 9-11. He was working at Kenner Fitzgerald, and um, we had a year and a half year old little girl, and I was pregnant. You were eight months pregnant. Eight months pregnant. Mm -hmm. And, um, they're now six, soon to be seven, and just turned five. Uh -huh. And I've remarried since then. Um, but that was a very difficult time for me. Unbelievably mm. unbearable. It's just, you know, it's, you can't imagine. Did you walk around saying, oh, yeah, my name means charmed one? Uh, yeah, there was a little irony to that uh -huh. after that. But yeah. um, it was a, uh, I didn't expect to come back to the business after that. I didn't expect that at all. I thought I would um, sort of stay home and raise my kids and, you know, be a stay-at-home mom and just be there with my children. But thank goodness uh, for the business, for acting and 
primarily Eve Ensler, who I got me back out there. I understand that that you in uh, Vagina Monologues, was, you, that um, you had some fun with that. I had a ball <laughs> with the Vagina Monologues. Yeah. I was, uh, my youngest daughter was born October 23rd, 2001, and five weeks later, Eve Ensler called me and said, I understand what has happened to you, but my only way of helping you is to offer you a chance to get back on stage for three weeks. She said, you don't have to rehearse. She said, you could read the monologues from the stage on a stool, and I think it would do your spirit some good. And she was right. She was a lifeline, and I've had several. And you did the whole. You did the entire, the entire weeks. piece. It wasn't like dividing up the roles. Oh no, no, no! It was three women. It was three women. Yes, okay, I did it with Kate Clinton. Yeah. And Marsha Warfield, remember her, from um, uh, from Bob Newhart show. Oh, oh, she sure. was. Oh God, what is her character's name with the red hair? Yeah. His his secretary. Yeah, I can picture, her, but I can't anyway, remember her name. Yeah. Marsha is her name. Yeah. And Kate Clinton, they were the other two women with me, and. Um, it was really a... Uh, You're, you had the orgasm one, right? Yeah, I had all the different types of <laughs> orgasms. <laughs> so Woo, that so that sort of got you back into the theater, huh? Yes, it did. I, I found my love for the theater again, and I was able to escape to a place that took me out of my life and, and my, my pain. And um, I just decided to keep working. So I started getting back out there. And... Your husband is a, your husband is a painter that you yes. commissioned him to do a a painting, a painting after 9/11. Yes, after 9/11, um, I, I had a lot of legal affairs, and the firm that handled all of my legal affairs because it was a lot of paper, um, they took me on pro bono, and they were with me for almost two years. So at the end of everything, when the final piece of paper had been signed, I thought, what can I give? These, these wonderful attorneys for their generosity. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that they had these brand new law for, these brand new offices down near the World Trade Center and no art anywhere. So I thought maybe I'd give them a piece of art with maybe a little plaque so that their other clients could see that they do such great work. And I was talking to my attorney at the time just about that and she said, I said, but I don't know what to do. Do they want a statue? Do they want a painting? And she said, uh, well, you know, I, my cousin is a painter. He's in Atlanta right now on another commission, but I can put you in touch with him and maybe you can talk to him and he can come up with a vision for what you'd like to express and maybe that would work. And I thought a painting, that might be nice. So um, she gave him my number and he called and we just started having conversations about the painting and about what he needed and to, to sort of uh, come up with a vision for the painting. Now, I hadn't seen him. He was just a voice on the other end of the phone. And we would talk after I put my kids to bed. So um, it started just being, you know, a casual conversation. But the questions he asked were very sensitive questions. And he had to ask about my relationship with my husband in order to, to come up with uh, an idea of what I was trying to communicate in, with my gratitude. And, you know, and he wanted to use my daughters as the muses in the painting. And it, it was just a beautiful idea, the concept that he came up with. But um, in the, the, the evening conversations, I found myself opening up to him in a way that I hadn't been to anyone else because I didn't see him. He was just this voice. And I felt some anonymity with that. And, um, it was just, it turned into, uh, it turned into something I started looking forward to in the evenings. And after a while, we weren't talking about the painting anymore. And um, it just blossomed. And I guess maybe almost two months after our phone conversations, almost two months, he said, I'm coming to New York. I'd like to meet my muses, meaning my daughters. And it um, makes me emotional when I think about it. But he, he came to New York, and we both knew that there was something going on more than uh, artist and, uh, a client and artist. And um, one thing led to another, and he started coming up more often. I started going down there more often, and um, we're married now. <laughs> and he, he moved here? 
Yes, he yeah. did. Yeah. Well, he had a studio here, uh -huh. so he would come back yeah. to work in his studio up here, and then we started uh, saying, why don't you just come back to New York? There was a time when you said that the thing that you used to like best about yourself was your resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, you, That's true. It's still true? <laughs> yes. I'm still kind yeah. of emotional. Sorry. Oh, sorry. About talking about I'm sorry. that. Sorry. Um, Yes. Um, God has given me a real keen sense of survival, survival instinct. And I didn't know that growing up. I just would throw myself in certain situations and just keep going forward, just keep putting my, my steps in front of, one step in front of the other. And that's pretty much how I handled 9-11. I just, um, you know, in my, in my private time, I would have my moments, but I also had a newborn that really needed me, and she had lost a father. She can't lose a mother, too, and that's all I kept thinking. She can't lose her mother, too, so I had to be there for her, and I wanted to be there more than, I, than, than she needed because her dad was gone, mm -hmm. you know. I really wanted to to just give them everything. I didn't want them to want for anything. And in order to do that, I had to get back out there and be strong and make life beautiful for them as much as possible. And in the giving and the doing, I was healed, mm -hmm. you know? That's what Oprah talks about sometimes. She says, if you want to feel good about yourself, give something away. And it's true. I found in the giving, I was healed, you know? There's something really special about giving. I have, um, you know, most of the roles that you've done mm -hmm. have been period pieces. Yes, they have been. You know, <laughs> I'm ready to live you know, in the moment. Dessa <laughs> Rose, you know, rebel slave, mm -hmm. slave, rebel slave. Um, bubbling, the bubbly black, the bubbly girl. black girl mm -hmm. changes, sheds her chameleon, sheds her skin. chameleon oh, skin. Wonderful musical, I thought that sort of disappeared mm -hmm. um, by Kristen, Kristen Child. Kristen Child, And yes. you, from there, at least you were able to play someone from the 60s to present tense. <laughs> yes, but the 70s. Mm -hmm. I, I have read that, that, um, that you feel that somehow the, the African-American women a actresses don't really get that much opportunity to do contemporary characters. In the theater. In the theater. In the theater. Um, rarely do you see an African-American woman in theater that is uh, leading in a musical that is of present day? Yeah. Really. I mean, if you can think of one, yeah. let me know. It has to be ancestral suffering. It has to be uh, not ancestral suffering so much because, you know, there are a lot of comedies. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, black women work in theater in all different mm -hmm. uh, aspects, comedy, drama, you know farce everywhere, but um, there aren't any modern musicals written today that uh, African American women are leading in, you know, and, and, and um, I don't know why that is, mm -hmm. honestly. I don't know if, uh, you know, what comes to mind immediately is something like um, the voice in Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk, but that was such a, a uh, we, you know, as far as musicals go, yeah. you think of that as something outside of the traditional genre of right, musical theater, right, yeah. even though it was in musical theater. And she wasn't really the character. She was, she was the voice. Yeah. So she sang, yeah. you know, which is you know, something that black women have done on Broadway for years, yeah. you know. Um, but to place, you know, a, a, a leading woman of, of, of uh, modern time is rare to see. Even... Um, I look at someone like Audra McDonald, her work, she's done amazing work in the theater. But look at the roles that she's done. Mm -hmm. She's done Raisin in the Sun most recently the and Ragtime, you know, Rag which we both did. Which you both did, right? And, um, you know, Carousel and uh, yeah. the, the Zoe Caldwell piece. Master class. Master class, yes. You know, but that was not a musical, really. It wasn't she sang, a musical. But it wasn't she a musical. Sang. Exactly. Um, we don't have much time left, so I, okay. I do remember that uh, that I read something about that you had recommended to actresses, to black actresses, that they try out for all kinds of roles. Yes. 
everything. Um, do people ask you this a lot? Do you, you know, do you feel that the audition process that that you're you're welcome to? One thing that I'm fortunate. Uh, to have experienced in the theater is I get asked to audition for everything and I'm so lucky yeah. because um, that doesn't have happen often but I have uh, made some very good relationships uh, with directors and producers and they like me and I'm happy about that <laughs> so they will ask me to come in I may not be cast but it gives me the opportunity to um, get out there a little bit more and and I do like that and the great thing about theater is you have to have talent to <laughs> succeed in yeah. theater. Rarely can someone sus sustain an eight show a week schedule and not really have the ability to do that, the talent and yeah. the, the, uh, the, the stamina to do that. So you have to have some, some bit of talent and ability to do that. And actors in theater, in order to get in the door, you have to have that. Yeah. And, and, and directors need talent, yeah. so it opens the door for so many. Um, thank you so much, mm -hmm. LaShawns. It's a perfect ending. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. And thank you for joining us. On behalf of the League of Professional Theater Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theater.